right, so you're 58 years old. You've saved $1.4 million. The question is, is can you retire successfully? You know, one of the most interesting things is, is when it comes to your retirement success, a lot of people feel like it's the amount that I've saved. Is it enough savings to last? Is it the rate of return? Is it my withdrawal rate? Is it the inflation rate that's gonna dictate my success? In fact, it's none of those things. The number one number is something that many people underestimate and don't even suspect. Today, I'm gonna to walk you in depth our planning process as to how we can secure and guarantee that families will have true success, retire with confidence come that time. Good day, everybody. Chris Herline here of Reap Financial, host of Retire Ready TV on News Channel 36 and host of Wealth Radio every Saturday, 11 a.m. on News Radio KLBJ. Thanks for tuning into our channel here today. We drop new content every Wednesday. If you like what you see, hit the subscribe button down below. All right, so you're 58. You've saved $1.4 million. The question is, is can you retire? You know, with retirement, it's not just a one size fits all. And it, the interesting thing is so many people have an arbitrary number. You may have an arbitrary number. How much money do I need to save to retire successfully? A lot of you may say, well, how much do I need to save to go out and pursue a passion or go out and buy the boats or the golf membership? or fly the family around the world. Whatever your value is, a lot of times, the focus is, do I have enough money? Well, saving alone is not the answer. Now, if you've saved over a million dollars in retirement or for your future retirement, you're in the upper echelon of retirees as compared to the rest of America. But you'd be surprised. It's not the number that can dictate your success. It's not even the amount that you're gonna receive in social security. It's not your rate of return. It has nothing to do with the most common things that people consider. So what I wanna do today is why walk you through a case study of a family that has a certain lifestyle they want to maintain. They've done a really good job of saving. They're wanting to retire on the young end of retirement. Like I said, 58 years old. So the question is, is how do you pull this off successfully? And it starts by having a written plan, a written plan. It's a living plan that you can update year to year as things change, progress that can be tracked and monitored. You know, the way families spend confidently is by being able to look out 10, 15, 25, 35 years as to the decisions they're making today, the expenses or the things they want to spend money towards today, their rate of return today. These type of things can be looked at decades in advance. And if there's going to be an issue, if it could create a deficiency, a problem, we want you to be able to identify these things well into advance so that you're never unconfident about your spending and concerned about running out of money too soon. So today, let's walk through these case studies. I'll bring it up on my screen here and I'll walk you through in detail. All right, so what we have here is Joe and Janie Smith, all right? And this is going to be a very, very close representation of the type of planning we do for our successful families at REIT Financial day in and day out. It's incredibly important that you get to see everything from the 30,000 foot view. And then at the same time, we can adjust some things throughout the planning to ensure that we're going to be able to pursue the things that are important to you, pursue whether it's travel, whether it's building out that car collection, whether it's, you know, again, helping family, helping causes you believe in, you got to know where you stand. So as I'm walking you through this, here is a family, Joe and Janie, that are making salaries of about 85,000 for Joe, 65,000 for Janie. And the plan here is to retire at the end of next year, 2024, the 59 years old upon retirement. Now, another thing we wanna look at is what are your social security benefits gonna look like? Social security benefits are one of the greatest assets that you have. And you never wanna take these things at face value because if you take them at face value, here's what happens. A lot of families, they think, well, if I take it early, you know, I'm gonna get more money out of the system. Maybe I don't have the longevity that my spouse has. Does it make sense for me to take it early on that front? You may be saying, I'm gonna wait as long as possible to take social security. And the issue there is, is that if you're not coordinating your social security benefits with 
your IRA and 401k distributions, whether it's brokerage accounts or cash accounts, you may be exhausting an account too early by waiting, which may put you in a position where you're living on more of a fixed income in retirement. And a lot of people don't want to ever find themselves in that position. So getting back to this, we've got social security benefits. We'll look at turning theirs on at the full retirement age. As I mentioned, that is not a one size fits all. We have many families that we retire every single year that are actually better served to take it early. Maybe not even because they need it, but because they are in a position where that makes more sense with their asset mix, okay? So we've got their benefit payments there. Then we're gonna take a look at all their assets. They've got cash at the bank, around 20,000 kind of operational checking. They've got a brokerage account, non-qualified money, that's after-tax brokerage. So we've got around 400,000 there. Joe has got around 450,000 in his 401k. We've got Janie's that's got about 390,000. And then what I like to see is they both have a couple Roth IRAs in the mix. Now, all this money is taxed differently. That's one of the things that a lot of people don't consider. Where you're saving, where you're saving is critically important because you gotta figure out how you're gonna get this money out in retirement in the most tax efficient way. Remember, by keeping more via taxes, it means you can spend more each and every year. So we get back to this and I see that they've got a nice mix of different money different tax classes, 401ks, IRAs, 1099, and more. So from here, we're gonna look at their house. They have a house paid off, not bad at age 58. It's worth about a half million dollars. Let's assume they're planning on staying in that house for years to come. And then we take a look at their risk. So if we think about risk being money that cannot be lost, money that is subject to risk, you can see that a large portion of their portfolio here is at risk. That means anything that can lose money. Remember, the bulk of their assets, as you remember here, are in mutual funds or equities that are subject to loss. The only thing in their plan right now is their bank checking. Now, you can invest in money markets and CDs with these type of accounts, but what I'm showing you is that you really want to consider your risk versus reward. More of the families that we see out there, they want to position their wealth in a way walking into retirement so they have some security, they have some stability. You know, when you're working and you're not living on the portfolio, you know, as hard as 2008 and 2022, as hard as those years are, you're not having to touch the portfolio. When you retire and it's time to start living on these assets, it can get a little bit more trying during those periods because you're drawing on your portfolio typically. When the market's working out, no problem. But when it's going down, it can create significant issues, particularly if you have a large withdrawal rate, if you're having to pull a lot from the portfolio. So getting back, we also see they have, they have different type of diversification in their tax class. This qualified money is your IRAs, your 401ks out there. This right here in the dark green, this would be your brokerage, which is taxed at more favorable capital gains rates. And then you've got the lighter green, which is your bank cash, which is taxed at like 1099 rates or your CDs. Even though you're not touching that money each year on a CD, you're still being taxed on money you're not using. So you need to be thinking about your tax diversification as well as your investment diversification. So as we move on here, we see that they're gonna work one more year here in 2023 to 2024. This is the income they have coming in. This is their contributions to their 401ks. And so that's their net income. And then that's their budget. So we're moving through this here and we get to retirement. Here we go, 2024, you can see that they're 59, they've got no pensions and no social security coming in yet because remember, we're not taking it in this scenario till age 67. So they've got a lot of years here without income. And there's another thing you gotta consider here is without 
Medicare. You've got to bridge the gap. Majority of families get on Medicare at age 65 and you have to bridge that gap. If you don't bridge that gap, that can create a significant liability if a health occurrence were to arise or what most people do retiring before 65 is they're gonna go out and they're gonna get an exchange care plan, something like an Obamacare plan. And something like that, generally you wanna budget anywhere between seven, $800 per month per person. So you need to be sure you're factoring that into your budgeting if you're planning on retiring early. Don't let that be missed because that's a lot of outflow. It's a lot of additional expense in the early years of retirement that can make a real lasting impact in a negative way if not accounted for properly. So we get back here and we can see that their budget at this time is about $9,800, okay? So what I'm showing you here is they, in this scenario, want a budget of 9,300 bucks a month, okay? That's what we started with, around 9,300. And the reason this budget goes up every year is because inflation. You can see here that that 9,300 next year is 98, 92 then it goes up each year. You have to account for inflation in your plan. So in this scenario, the 98, 92 is coming out of their assets over here. This is all the accounts that I just went through. The 401ks, the cash, the Roth IRAs, the brochures, et cetera. This protected asset, this is their house. So you can see that that's going up very reasonably. Now, a lot of you, you may be asking, what kind of rate of return are you putting on the retirement or spendable assets here, Chris. I'm using a conservative rate of return of 6%. So an average rate of return of 6%. And I believe that is conservative in today's environment where you can get five and 6% bank CDs. So if you are considering a retirement portfolio and you have some guaranteed accounts in there, and then you've got some equity exposure, in today's environment, we believe that 6% in our models are rather conservative. So 6% is the rate of return there. And then we've got inflation at just around three and a half percent. So that's the inflationary rate that you're seeing go up on there. So we're moving along and you're seeing that we've got these amounts that are going up every year. And that's because the budget's going up every year. So you can see that the drawdown on the accounts is taking effect here. And then when we turn 67, we've got two social security checks that are kicking in. So at that point, we've now got some steady income. So there's our income coming in. You've got your net monthly expense. And what we've done is we've been able to chip down the deficit here. So it went from 12.3 to 8,200. That's because we're modeling 4,500 coming in. The budget's 12.7 and our shortfall is 8,200 now coming out of here. So now we're just moving along. Social Security has a very, very conservative cost of living adjustment on it. We're using just shy of 2%. So as you can see, we like to run things very lean, very conservative. Inflation is increasing as well. We move into our 70s here and you can see here we are 72. Their Social Security is now 5111. The budget's at 15,000 and the deficit's at 98. You can see here, that we're about 15 years into retirement and we've only got about a half million dollars left. And you can see that in these later years, we've exhausted the accounts now completely at age 77. Now they still have the social security coming in, but they're now living on a fixed income because they've exhausted the assets here. Now one would say, well, they still have their home equity. The house has definitely increased in equity over the years, but at this point in time, if you're running and into this situation, you're now considering having to downsize to take some of this equity out and drop it back into your spendable assets. That means you're likely moving. You could consider a home equity line of credit, but that adds to the budget. A lot of families may do a reverse line of credit and they can pull money out of their house without having to pay it back. The loan will be paid back upon the sell of the house down the road. The simplest situation here is Maybe the family at 77 doesn't want that large house any longer. 
or they don't need it any longer. So maybe they've sold the house and they've you know repurchased something for a half million, 600,000 and banked a few hundred thousand to keep going in these retirement years. But I'm gonna tell you right now, 77, that's too close for comfort. That is way too close for comfort in this situation. If we see a family that is running out of money in their 70s, we're letting them know, even though you had the 1.4 million, it's not feasible to retire at this point in time with the current lifestyle, with the current budget that you have. Now, remember, I started out today's segment by saying a lot of people feel that success is dictated by the amount they've saved or about the amount they can make on their assets the amount that inflation is going to impact them. But here's the most important number in your plan. It's the budget. And most people don't really live on a budget when they're working. I get that. But when you retire, you have to at least stay within some parameters. And this is the most powerful thing amongst the planning that I'm showing you is that this is where families can come in. They sit down with our team of fiduciary advisors and they say, hey, how much can we spend and never worry about running out of money? How do we cut the check confidently? And can we do this at 59 or 58 in this example? Well, what I want us to look at now is the budget and how the budget is the make or break in the success factor in retirement. Have a look here with me. So in this scenario, remember the family started out with a budget of $95 hundred dollars walking into retirement. Now, in this scenario that I'm going to walk you through, this family, same amount of assets, the 1.4 million, same rate of return of 6%, same retirement date. Here we are. The difference is their budget is not the 9,500, it's 8,000. We have a budget of $8,000 in this case with the same inflation rate and we go into retirement. So here we are, 59, no income coming in, and our budget's now 8,500 because of inflation. So we're pulling 8,509 out per month. That's coming right out of here with the same 6% growth rate, same appreciation rate on the house. Social security kicks in, the shortfall is now 6,500. If you remember in the last scenario, it was well over 8,000. And we continue moving into their 70s now. And if you remember in the last scenario, the family was out of money at 77. In the last scenario right here, they had around 529,000 in their portfolio. And the scenario with the $8,000 budget at age 72, they still had a million plus. And you can see how their money continues to last until about age 84. Now, at 84, that's a pretty big leap between the 77 scenario I just showed you, but I'm going to tell you something. Today's world, males, our average living expense is 88. Females today, it's 92. So when we're modeling these type of plans, again, in this scenario, I would not feel confident telling a family that they could retire at 58 successfully with the 1.4 million. Remember, the budget is everything here. So now what I'm doing is I'm backing into, okay, if, if the objective is to retire at age 58, how much really can you spend every single month with confidence and not have to see your money exhausted? That's where I wanna take you here. So in this scenario, remember the budget was 8,000, versus 9,500. So that's only about a $1,500 difference. You, you think about 1,500, that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but when you compound that over a 25, 35 year retirement career, it's a lot of money. So I take you to our final scenario, same family with the same assets of 1.4 million wanting to retire at 58. You can see here that the scenario that we're working with is a budget of 6,500, $6,500 a month budget. Remember how House is paid off, so 6,500 is what we're targeting here. We walk into retirement, same scenario, no income up until 67. So in this case, we're pulling out 69.13 now at retirement. That's gone up with inflation. We've got that coming right out of our assets. And you can see here, when social kicks in, now the deficit's only about 4,400. And we're moving along and we get now into our 70s. 
Remember in the first scenario, they had only had about a half million dollars. In this one, they're still sitting at 1.6. And even though they're withdrawing each and every year, this amount on a monthly basis, you can see that their assets are actually still increasing because their withdrawal rate is under 1% of their net worth. Not until right here at about 82, do we see their withdrawal rate over 1%. And that's where you can see the assets start trending down. But the 1% factor doesn't happen until they're in their mid to late years of retirement. They're in their 80s. And so now we're at 90 and we're still sitting at 1.35 million. We get down here all the way out to age 100. Now we're sitting at 161,000. No red line. Their house has continued to appreciate. So if they're blessed to live a long life into these years, they may have to sell off the house or downsize to have adequate funds to afford things like long-term care, home health care, nursing home care, those type of events. We want to see if you can self-insure. But what the most powerful takeaway is here is it's not about how much you save. It's about how much you want to spend in retirement. How much do you need to be able to generate in your portfolio to sustain the lifestyle you want to maintain? And, and like so many retirees, you may want to increase your lifestyle in retirement. Now, a few things that need to be considered in this planning that I'm I'm showing you today. One is your tax bracket. Everybody's caught up on rates of returns and withdrawal rate in retirement, but your tax bracket in retirement is a huge factor because when you turn 73 or 75, you have what's called required distributions. Now behind the scenes and the models that I just showed you, all of our taxes are being taken out, our required distributions are being taken out. What can happen is if you jump tax brackets throughout your retirement years, all that means is more is having to leave your wealth in going to the government. We're losing a lot of the compounding effect. We're losing a lot of those dollars that could be breaking a sweat for you. So by maintaining a lower tax rate or tax bracket in retirement, that is a big factor in ensuring that your money lasts as long as you do. The best way to garner the tax control in retirement is to have a very well diversified portfolio, not just asset mix, but tax diversified portfolio. Some money that you can live on that's never going to be taxed. Some money that you can live on that will maybe be somewhat taxed like your brokerage accounts at more preferable cap gains rates, or you're going to have money in like IRAs and 401ks that's always taxed. But by designing an income plan as to how and when you want to pull this money out, that income plan, that distribution strategy can create significant impact in the success that you have. And what I mean by that is if you look on the screen here, this income should not just be taken out willy-nilly. If you've got assets over here of 401ks, brokerage accounts, and Roth IRAs, how you take money out of this account every single month has to be thought through and coordinated in a way that's looking for the next 20, 30 years. This 6,900 doesn't just have to be made up of just your 401k or your Roth IRA it's likely needs to be a mix of several of the accounts so that you're not withdrawing from one account too early, too soon. Another thing I want you to consider is Roth conversion planning. I've talked a lot about Roth conversion planning over the year, but it's a, it's a really big piece of our successful retirees planning. It's what families understand as a get to, not a got to. It allows you to take money in your traditional IRAs, 401ks, and convert it into Roth IRAs. When you convert, the money, you got to pay taxes. You got to pay the price of admission to get in to the Roth. But once the taxes have been paid, that money will forever grow and go tax-free to your heirs. And most importantly for you, there's no required minimum distribution on the Roth. So you're in total control. And so one of the things that families don't understand is what their tax liability could be. Well, I want to take a look at this real quick. This is the case study that we just showed you. The family has $840,000 in pre-tax accounts. That's the IRA's 401ks. Let's assume that they live to age 90, okay? When we look at your required minimum distributions over your retirement career, on that $840,000, this family is set to pay $408,000 in taxes in RMDs. Nearly half of the present value will be due in taxes over their retirement career. 
as that IRA increases in value. Now, we also need to look at the fact that many families will take the required minimum distribution and then reinvest it. Well, this is what we estimated they'll pay in taxes on their reinvested required distributions that go in their brokerage accounts. And then when they leave their wealth to their heirs, your kids, your friends, your family, they have to take the IRA dollars as inheritance within 10 years, it must be fully distributed. So what we just did here is we look at a present value a 401k IRA at 840,000 and over two generations between the family and their heirs, $968,000 in taxes. Now, let me tell you something. When you start looking at it like that, it starts getting easy or interesting to get into the Roth game because taxes are at historic lows right now as of the date of this message. They've never been this low in 40 years. They're likely going to remain this low until at least 2026. And so our successful clients at Reap Financial, you know what they're doing? They're taking advantage of this Roth conversion because they know that taxes could likely be higher in the future. And the idea of having tax-free money in retirement is more and more appealing when the prospects of taxes going up are pretty strong. So in this scenario, we also look at what would it cost, what's the price of admission to get into the Roth? Well, if we converted systematically and strategically over a period of several months or years, in this example, we'd pay $302,000 to get it all converted. Now, I'm gonna tell you right now that it doesn't make sense for most families to convert everything. You don't need to convert everything. Unless your waking value is to leave as much money to your kids as possible and or you're in the highest tax bracket in the tax code today and you're always gonna be there. And the reasons for that could be you got a lot of guaranteed income. Those are a couple of reasons you may wanna consider converting most if not everything, okay? But the objective in converting Roth is to try to convert enough over the years that when you hit your required distribution age, it's not gonna push you up into a higher tax bracket. What happens is if your RMD kicks in and it pushes you up tax brackets, even if it's not year one, even if it's maybe year three or year five, the issue with that is that you're now giving more of your social security income back. If you have a pension, more of that's going back. The distribution, the required distribution you're forced to take, that's gonna be taxed. More is coming out of your accounts there. And then we also gotta account for Medicare premiums. Your Medicare premiums are gonna be dictated by your income. Not not your net worth. And I want us to take a look at our Medicare situation, okay? So most families out there, they've never even considered how much they're going to pay in Medicare. Medicare is one of these things that is a great benefit. It's very comprehensive, but you got to be mindful that you may pay more Medicare than your next door neighbor. What we did is we're able through this process to show families exactly what they may pay. And so we have projected Joe's age out to 88, Janie to 91. And over that period of time, we're projecting that they're going to pay around $473,000 in Medicare premiums. Now that comes out of your social security check, $473,000. That's more than most Americans have even saved. It's incredible to think about, but that's on the lower end. For those of you out there that have done a great job of saving in IRAs, 401ks, I'm gonna tell you right now, you're in a position where you may end up paying a lot more, a lot more. We have families that are paying five, $600 per month per person for the same Medicare their neighbors are getting for 300 plus a month. And when you look at that, that compound effect, we will show families through our planning process, you may be in a position where you can pay hundreds of thousands of dollars more. We've seen families on that analysis right there that are paying six, seven hundred thousand dollars a month per couple where they could be paying a lot less. So where am I going? The point of all this, it's about designing your wealth plan to keep as much of you can as you can via taxes. By keeping more, you can spend more. By keeping more, your money lasts longer. But the true takeaway is if you're 58 with 1.4 million, what is the most important number? It's the number needed. It's your budget needed to maintain or increase your standard of living in retirement, okay? One of the things I want to offer you right now is I want you to get a copy on our 10 top retirement tips guide. Go right now to reapfinancial.com. That's reapfinancial.com. You can download a copy of it right there. And it really talks about the top 10 tips, the things that we walk our families through to ensure that they're walking into retirement with total and complete 
success. If you're interested in taking advantage of a retirement analysis that I showed you today, a Medicare analysis, a Roth analysis, we do this in 60 minutes at no cost for all of our YouTube viewers, all of our KXAN and KLBJ families. And if you're approaching retirement or you've just retired and you have not had a formal written plan done, you need to take advantage of this. Go to reapfinancial.com, click on the top button there. It says, get in touch in the top right corner. And right there, you can book a one-on-one -on -one appointment with myself or one of our fiduciary advisors to walk you and your family through this, give you some clarity, give you some confidence that you don't have today. You'll walk away with some concrete ideas that you can go implement on your own or potentially we can help you implement. But either way, you're gonna have a terrific consulting experience and walk away on the same page financially with your spouse that maybe you aren't today. Go to reapfinancial.com right now, click on the get in touch button there, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Until then, all the best to you and your family.